buenos días. Buenas tardes. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Valentina Morales. I'm the specialist on the technical support in the for the team family farming at the FAO office. And I'm going to be here today as the moderator during this session. So welcome to the first version on for the dialogue of knowing and practices of family farming. Before getting started, I would like to remind you that we have simultaneous interpretation and we're also going to be recording this uh, session so that you can find it afterwards. Uh, in the, we, we're going to share with you the link in the chat. So this series of uh, dialogue on family farming and ecology wants to promote collaborative knowledge and the transfer of uh, knowledge between the different stakeholders. And the purpose is to uh, share the different contributions as part of uh, the agrofood system agenda. So we have the global pillars uh, for family farming and the priorities for Latin America and the Caribbean in the Santiago letter from 2022. As I mentioned, and this is done through the technical, the regional technical platform for family farming and we're going to share the link with you afterwards so you can access the recording and we're going to have the technical support of family farming and the parliamentary networks all the sessions are part of the global cooperation agenda to share uh, all the knowledge and we consider three topics Topics. The first one, which is the first edition between November this year, about the contribution of family farming as part of the climate agenda. And the next two uh, topics that we're going to cover is the investment of family farming and the role of the sector to promote inclusive participation. And number three is family farming and construction of sustainable market. The first edition is co-organized with the family farming uh, of the Mercosur and the national coordination in the farming industry. We have had some dialogue about the potential of agroecology within family farming to face the different challenges of the transformation agenda, particularly the challenges uh, uh, related to the climate. Climate. So we've had, this is the first session, the first one uh, included the main practices of agroecology and the relation to family farming and with the mitigation of climate change and the environmental agenda. And number two, a few weeks ago, focus on institutionality and agroecology, and we had presentations from Mercosur countries, and they discuss a program in public policies. And now this third and last session is going to be focusing on experiences from the different parts of the world about family farming and of this practice and the importance of this transition towards agroecology. So having said that, we are going to have four presentations. We're going to start by Swati from India. She's an associate scientific at the World College, and she's going to be share with us uh, the experience in India. And then we're going to have a presentation by Arthur from Togo, Africa. He is the executive uh, deputy secretary of the coordination of rural organizations. And she's all, he's also going to be sharing our uh, experience on the national strategy. Then we're going to have a presentation uh, about this from Spain, the experience about the organ, the farming experience at El Cayo and 
Y por último, vamos a continuar. And finally, we are going to have a presentation by Guillermo Brady, the head of the Family Farming Participation and the Parliamentary Networks of FAO. And uh, he is going to share with us the progress on the um, bill that it's being discussed. After the four presentations, we are going to have a Q&A session. So we'd like to invite you to take notes about these four presentations so that at the end, we can have a, a dialogue, a conversation with the audience. So I'm going to tell the, pres the presenters, the speakers, uh, how they are doing with time. So we're going to start with Swati's presentation. So if you're ready, please, you can get started and you're going to have uh, 15 uh, minutes. And I'm going to let you know as soon as you have uh, two minutes left. Uh, good evening, everyone. Valentina, I am guessing uh, you have given me a go ahead to make the presentation. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Namaste everyone. Uh, my name is Swati. Um, right now it's uh, I'm I'm right now in, from India. Uh, uh, we are it's it's seven forty five here. And uh, good morning, good afternoon from wherever you are in whichever part of the world. Um, thank you so much for inviting us uh, for 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 uh, making this presentation. Uh, the next ten fifteen minutes, I would uh, focus on uh, ensuring that. Uh, So uh, the next 10 to 15 minutes would be dedicated on seeing that there is a hope uh, still remaining regarding food systems and agroecology. Um, we have always seen that agroecology has been around for a century or more. And uh, the, if it is so good, why hasn't it scaled up? One question has been uh, crit for, to critique agroecology has been that uh, is it a niche farming? Is it only restricted to small geographical area? Is it only to be done in small silos? Uh, can we can we look at agroecology from scale perspective? And uh, I am bringing an example from the state of Andhra Pradesh, where we are talking about a government program, a government initiative that has been taken to convert the entire state into natural farming, which we are uh, uh, saying as a as as agroecology. So before that. I'm just wanting to lay context. Uh, I am in Asia right now. I have colleagues, you know, from Africa or or then you all, many of them are from South America. While we are divided by continents, we are united by one important element of climate change. We are uh, united by the farm crisis. We are united by the food growers, the food producers who are going almost, if not the same problems. The problem is of that farm Farming is in distress. Food systems have fractured, especially after a post-COVID world. And a bigger uh, virus is of climate emergency. And it's going to, it, and, and we are feeling the impacts of it. We can see the climate change. We can see the crop variation. We can see that the drought in rainy seasons, rains in drought seasons. We are looking at food scarcity. And we are, this all majorly is attributable to the farming that we have done till now. The last 50, 60 years is when we jeopardized the entire farming and food systems. And now is the time that we are talking about that how do we address this crisis? Because the, the, these all crises are interlinked. So climate change cannot be looked in, in, in isolation. Food crisis or farm districts cannot be looked in isolation because all these are interlinked. And that is the context that we all are united today. We are here talking about an example from Asia that the problems, I'm very sure that uh, uh, the, the farm families in uh, South America are facing is similar to a small marginal landholder in Asia and India. So this is the context. This is what's happening. So now while the problem exists, we have to talk about solutions and that is why we are here. So 
before going through the solution is we we need to really understand we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that we used to create them and that is where the beauty of agroecology comes into picture that it's diverse it is heterogeneous and it offers a solution while it is similar but it's not the same it contextualizes with itself and that is uh in this contextualization of agroecology i'm talking about andhra pradesh uh, where you can see the country of india and then the red marked state is the state of andhra pradesh uh, when i mention a state it's basically a province so india is divided into 29 provinces so for your understanding you can consider andhra pradesh as a province now obviously agroecology will be interpreted in different ways uh, and i am sure we have all been part of debates what is the definition of agroecology why who should do it what 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 is comprises of agroecology what our understanding or interpretation is that we want to mimic nature we realize that you cannot go beyond nature and and put something externally available inputs into the soil into the village the context complete the, con the the context completely differs so something which is produced in a factory elsewhere in some northern part of india cannot be utilized or put and and and, and refurbish the soil in southern part of india so what we are saying that the universal while that that we need to mimic nature and we need to harness the power of Uh, of 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 a photosynthesis and we need to talk about building soil health we need to fix the carbon cycle we need to fix the water cycles we need to have crop resilience in a world of climate change and what we say is that when if i am talking about natural farming the next 5 10 minutes i am talking about agroecology which natural farming falls under the uh, larger umbrella of agroecology the principles are universal i am very sure whatever is on the right side of the screen is something which we all have inherited we are talking about diversity of crops we are talking about diversity of seeds we are talking about integrating animals into farming minimum disturbance of soil and one of the biggest non negotiable is we do we are shunning the use of bd side fertilizer herbicide pesticide so anything which is chemically grown which falls under the paradigm of green revolution we are encouraging and motivating farmers to shun those practices and and mimic nature so these are the principles this is the knowledge that exists now what we have what what is happening with this knowledge so this knowledge which is there on your screen is is now another problem is how do we take this knowledge the big problem of agroecology what we have seen is that we focus on the knowledge we focus on the small elements of science we focus on you know which bio stimulant or bio you know what if should we use a cow dung should we use manure should we use vermicompost rather than talking that how do we take this knowledge to communities uh, to to more more farmers or farm families and food growers this is what we in andhra pradesh where we claim to be the largest agroecological program in the world have been trying to solve this is the scale this is what can happen in the last 5 years 6 years of a state a small a, a, a state uh, in india i am talking today of 8 lakh 50000 farmers or farm families in natural farming and and then we are talking about a million farmer by next year so if you are seeing that scale as an element when i talk about scale i am talking about more number of farmers more farms more uh, package of practices that come under the purview of agroecology and natural farming and we cannot look at scale only with respect to numbers we need to also look at it with respect to the farms that are being practiced upon so if you can see this is what is the picture today of andhra pradesh now i will focus on how we have been able to achieve this see when i started my presentation i said that knowledge cannot be looked at into in isolation what is the focus of this government program and this is where we excel and thrive is that we focus more on taking it to the communities i think we leave uh to the wisdom of communities that the knowledge will reach them automatically you know green revolution especially kept women out of the focus they kept small farm families out of focus what an apcnf program as a natural farming government program we are wanting to actually 
basically acknowledge is that knowledge needs to be with the community and their wisdom needs to be incorporated we cannot talk about a world in future where we actually are ignoring the communities and the knowledge and with, this is the reason the the, the agroecology needs to be integrated with farm families and their communities Andhra Pradesh offers this advantage because there is a huge social capital with respect to the women sector groups. A biggest learning, if you want to take away from my presentation, uh, as as I am going to go further, is that you have to bring bringing people together. The source majority of things in your context, in which you are part of South America or Africa or Asia, you are from right now joining, collectivizing or bringing people together to solve an issue is of critical. So even if you are an NGO, even if you are a science organization, even if you are a network, bringing people together and passing on the knowledge is extremely critical. Now, what we are doing is. I am a I am a development professional, but who who is who will take this farmer or knowledge? Is Swati cannot take this knowledge to a farmer? It is only a farmer who has done natural farming, who is doing natural farming, who is doing agroecology on a daily basis, needs to talk to another farmer. That see, I have done farming, I have done agroecological farming, natural farming. I benefited from this. You should also do it. So the trust building mechanism is much higher rather than somebody who do not. belong to the village who is somebody from outside who just comes and give one day or two day of training and say and and say you know you should do this training of one day two day or a week will not bring any change you need to invest into local champions who will be there with the community and talk about transformation or transitioning to natural farming to agroecology please bear in mind there are a lot of training centers giving 3 days 4 days 5 days of training will not help we are talking about building capacities we are talking about building more champion farmers who stay with the communities and who solve their problems so this is where with the farmer are the heroes of the program of ours now while farmers are there we need to facilitate this and that is where you know the the technology or digital uh, mediums comes into picture so we are talking about mobile phones and in india especially the penetration of mobile or smartphones have been incredible so we use this available technology with respect to our training uh, capacity building with respect to our monitoring with respect to our data collection data management videos you know whatever you can think of that is required for dissemination of knowledge uh, technology is a major major facilitating agency this is a very crucial crucial slide what i we are wanting to say is that to change one farmer to to change one farmer from not practicing chemical farming or conventional farming and and to transition to agroecology to transition to natural farming you need to change the entire village and that is where the systems element of into comes that saturation approach comes that you need to focus on transforming all farmers in a gradual and phased manner into natural farming so if you see in year, we are not talking about you know going radical and changing and uh, the entire village we are saying in a village we only focus on 10 to 15% these are you know enthusiastic farmers who come and say yes yes i will take the risk these risk takers becomes the first change agent because they practice for a year then you know second year we said okay the trust building among the farmers also start developing so you're talking about 35 to 50% and it takes 5 years there is no magical bond which can transform the world into agroecology you have to invest so it takes 5 to 8 years to transform a village of 500 farm families to natural farm into agroecology so i request you all to have that faith and give agro ecology that much time for transformation so uh, this all is not happening in isolation uh, i mean one of the big elements you know donors and policy makers or politicians of the world they say uh, there is evidence and uh, as a government program we believe that developing the science of natural farming or agroecology solution we do not want to associate an anecdotal or uh, you know uh, 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 anecdotal uh, stigma to agroecology it's a science it's a rigorous science and we have national and international big names that are associated to develop this 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 uh, science and research element and mind you all we are not the only condition for our sciences that we will do all the research with our 
actual practicing communities research cannot happen in laboratories you know in a closed manner it should happen within the communities it should happen with the community so science is a first precursor for the knowledge so we are developing science we are developing evidence we we want to talk about soil we want to talk about crop diversity seed diversity we want to talk about you know the economic impact the yield and the, uh, and and all of that is being taken by the research that has been conducted in the program so i uh, this was a snapshot of what a scale program or what agroecology as a potential can hold and what i want to end with is that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestor we borrow it from our children so children so what we need to do is we need to start acting we need to stop fighting among ourselves with the definitions of agroecology which is very prominent you know what is agroecology or sustainable farming or regenerative or you know or, or natural farming we should be talking about the solution and the bigger principles and bring a transformation change so i hope i was able to give you a slice of what we are doing there is much more that's happening in india uh, thank you so much for uh, giving us this opportunity to showcase our work back to you valentino thank you very much kwati for that excellent presentation and for your inspiring words and and facts that you shared with us today thank you very very much muchísimas gracias kwati for for la excelente presentación de hoy y I would like to thank you for your, your excellent uh, presentation and for sharing with us the agricultural uh, concepts and insights and uh, also because uh, you have addressed what we need to address. And of course, the focus must always be in the community, in the work with small farmers, with family farmers, and with the people who at the end of the day will be the ones that will be leading this work. So thank you so much for that. Anyone who wishes to ask a question or wants to learn more about this, we will have time at the end of the meeting where we will be able to discuss this at length. Um, um, without further ado, we will move now on to a presentation by Arthur Slogan from Togo, Africa. Go ahead, please. You have 15 minutes. Okay. Merci beaucoup. J'espère que vous m'entendez très bien. Et donc, moi, je suis Arthur Zogan. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. Je viens du Togo. My name is Arthur Zogan. I come from Togo, and I'm the executive secretary of CETOP, which is the coordination of Togo, of the Farmer Association and Agricultural Products, and I'm the permanent secretary of the is the agricultural um, platform in our country. I would like to share the experience of Togo with the evolution of the last decades and how we have evolved and how we have developed agroecological practices. My presentation will be focused on six points. The first of which is uh, speaking a little bit about Togo and PNAFAT, and then I'll talk about the, the challenges of uh, family farming. And then I will talk about how agroecology is taken as a strategy to be able to face agri-food systems in our countries. And then I'll talk about an initiative that we have developed and that we're using currently and what the recommendations are that we think are necessary to be able to improve agroecology and family farming in the agri-food. Resume, le Togo, comme vous le voyez là, in summary, de de Togo, as you can see, is a small African country located in the west of Africa. Africa. It's part of five donc, large regions of the de African donc, continent. Il est sur it carré. is part of western Africa, Africa. and it has uh, 6,600 square meters. Its population is 8.1 million inhabitants. Est, est, est 51 of which are women, and the population is mostly rural. 60% lives in rural areas, and this population, basically, uh, the livelihood is farming. 
y la actividad familiar es, es, es el que participe a, a plus de 95% euh, au niveau du Togo. Et donc, les agriculteurs familiaux se réunissent, comme je le sais, dans la plupart des pays, en deux petites coopératives. Family farming. Family farming. Family farming. There are two cooperatives. From 2001, this is the national platform where I work. So this system is the one that creates all the different networks for family players. So this is a federation where we have family farmers which are part of these networks. So in 2013, the networks of agriculture in the civil society implemented together in 2013 this national system, which is called the PNAFAT, to promote family farmers in El Togo. So starting from there, we have 30 organizations approximately which are part of these networks. We have organizations of producers, even organizations of young people and women. We also have non-governmental networks of NGOs. We also have training sectors and research. So these are the old, are the organizations, which are 30 approximately, which uh, organize together to implement the PNA FAT to promote family farming because 95% of them are family farmers. So since we implemented this organization, this network, Work, the, it consolidated with some other organizations. For instance, they have a coordination office, they have a permanent secretariat of this platform, and some uh, different uh, groups, theme groups. And some of them work on the land, or others on uh, uh, agricultural funding, and different topics. They also focus on agroecology. So they normally try to discuss topics that are key to us to analyze the proposals of this network as part of the different programs uh, implemented by our states. Since then, we've been working on different areas, for instance, the involvement of the global governance of the agricultural sector. We also work to make contributions to the uh, agricultural activity of Togo from 2016-2030. We've also been working next to the state to build a bill on agricultural guidance. We're also working on the preparation of a plan to promote farm farmer, farming, which uh, was led by the PNA FAT with the participation of all the different entities from the state. This was a very participatory process, and it took a, approximately a year with a consult from all the different sectors. We had dialogue uh, sessions with the authorities to produce a national plan to promote family farming with seven pillars. We've also contributed to, with the elaboration of a national strategy to develop agroecology in El Togo, and we also work to strengthening the uh, involvement of family farmers to implement these uh, agro poles, which are development uh, instances uh, that we wanted to implement in different areas in order to face for this, and we had to work so that the family activity was uh, respected. So today, uh, the PNA fee part is centralized and is distant in the different five regions with implementation of uh, regional platforms. 
Now, as for the food system in Togo, we have some challenges that are not just food that affect Togo, but also challenges that we're going to find in most of African countries. So, for instance, the low productivity, the high cost of uh, agricultural products, particularly after the energy crisis, and we're also related to uh, water issues, water management. In Togo, less than 5% of the lands are irrigated, so uh, agricultural activity relies on or is affected by climate change. There is also an impact because of climate change, specifically, and we have a very weak um, Automation system, we have very poor financing system. We have uh, credits uh, that uh, have 30 40% of interest rate and they haven't been adapted. We all are lacking a quality infrastructure. The systems are in poor conditions. We do not have preservation system for food. So, this is a little bit of the context. Uh, where the family activity has to face. Now, despite all of these different challenges, 95% uh, is uh, done by families. And this is the main way in which we affect the food system. So this activity covers the needs of the different consumers when it comes to cereals, for instance. And this contributes we have some deficit in the area of in production. This is not a, a country that produces meat, so we also have some problems in that area. Now, this agriculture creates employment, and it preserves biodiversity, preserves our cultural identity. So we always have activities that are related to our culture in our country. So it's very resilient and it's resistant to climate shocks, for instance, and the crisis of COVID, for instance. The family uh, farmers of uh, Togo manage uh, to place products in the market to feed the population. So today, agroecology in Togo has been recognized as a strategy to be able to face different challenges in terms of resilience when it comes to food systems. The different challenges that we've uh, covered, such as the water issues, for instance, uh, the issue of climate change. And today, agroecology is recognized as one of the main strategies uh, to face the food issues. In Togo, specifically, we have a program, the regional program to support the, agri the farming transition in the West. So this program was developed by the Western Africa and Togo is very much committed to this program. In Togo, we are trying to develop a national strategy for the development of agroecology. And today, we have a national framework about agroecology, which is an instance which has been implemented by the government, who groups all the different state and non-state stakeholders to exchange ideas about a strategy, about the procedures that need to be implemented to promote the agroecological transition. Currently, the country is preparing an action plan, a letter about this uh, framework. I would also like to highlight that agroecology is part of our strategies and we have a national program that has that was launched last year called the food systems in Togo. This is a five-year program to strengthen the resilience of the food system. So, and in this case, we have uh, agroecology. So, in, in the area, in the case of family farmers, uh, they work with different networks to develop different initiatives to promote agroecology. And one of these uh, initiatives is going to be shared with you. So, when we consider all of these elements, we can clearly see that the country s'engage de plus en plus dans l'agroécologie is committed to agroecology and the role of family farming 
is strengthened as part of this agroecology transition, particularly to produce quality food in good quantities, to promote uh, good practices, to preserve the resources and to respect the environment. Voilà, et donc euh, nous, en tant qu'acteurs de la PNAFAT, nous avons travaillé so sur as... un modèle euh, de promotion so de l'agroécologie. In a model to promote agroecology, this model is based on agroecological practices through all the family farming, which has been developed by rural uh, farmers. This initiative started in 2019 with different uh, agricultural schools, uh, particularly young people that were part of this network, and they strengthened the different capacities about the techniques and these schools these schools today are 15 so every year we select some people to be trained in these farming schools during 15 days so since 2019 as a result of this initiative which uh, was created by uh, farmers we've uh, trained 3,360 youngsters and everything related to agroecology and agroecological practice. So today, the sea top is uh, a key, plays a key role to promote agroecology. And we've capitalized all of these practices uh, that we've implemented with the government. The government is committed towards agroecology. And we've started working on this initiative, as I said, in 2019, with FAO as part of family farming. And we are working also with the World Bank and the state as part of a program. So this is how, starting this year, that we've been working on endogenous Initiative. And we are capitalizing and valuing the policies and the different programs at the national level so that the state can is no longer skeptical uh, in regards to agroecological practices so that they can participate in the production and they can create some legal instances so as to promote this activity based on state programs so that these initiatives are considered more seriously. So this year we uh, started talking, uh, working with the World Bank to work on the different programs. So here you can see some pictures young people who are being trained on agroecological practices. These are young people who know how to produce some agricultural inputs, materials. These are different practices, different training sessions. So all of these works uh, that we implemented have given us some interesting perspectives in order to scale them with the support of the GAF. And we have some fund uh, given to the CTOP to promote this agro-ecological agro area. We're going to work with more than 5,000 farms and we have the support from the production units so that agroecology can be promoted in the entire territory. We are trying to convince the state that there are more than 25 agricultural zones do this. We want to promote the agroecological practices. These are huge areas of five hectares or more that are working with agroecology. So these are initiatives that are working at a large scale with these agricultural schools. And starting in 2024, we're going to uh, identify the capacities of these schools and we want to work together with them. So in terms of recommendations, 
about what we have, we think that for agroecology to be part of family farming and in the agricultural food systems, of course, we need to work in the market of the uh, agroecology products. And it's important to know how to work in these markets to strengthen family farming so that there is a commitment towards agroecology. We're also thinking that it's very important to develop knowledge and the, to understand the impact of agroecology in the quality and quantity of food. And we also need to train producers more on these agroecological practices. If we want to solve all of these issues, we think that agroecology in the context of of climate crisis can be considered as the strategy of the universe of family farming. Well, my dear participants, this is what I wanted to uh, share with you. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your excellent presentation. It's very uh, concise. And so we are applying this program for family farming in countries such as Togo uh, are participating and they have been holding meetings for several um, years already as part of the 10 year uh, plan for the decade of family farming. And it's very important to see how, as part of this movement, the focus on agroecology is so important. And it's very strategic for the uh, decade of family farming and for the agri food systems and the challenges that are faced by countries such as Togo. So thank you for your presentation. We already have some questions for the panel members, but we will leave the Q&A session for the end of the presentation. So thank you very much. I would like to remind our participants that we have simultaneous interpretation. You can find that in at the bottom of your screen to choose the language of your preference. And the session is being recorded. We will move on to the next uh, presentation by Unai Aranguren, who will be speaking about the experience from Spain. Unai, you have 15 minutes. Good afternoon. Uh, I come from the vast country between Spain and France in the European continent. It's a highly industrialized and urbanized continent where actually peasants form a very small part of the population. And it's, of course, a very uh, old uh, practice type of setting. There are no new generations that want to go into family farming. So I wanted to share an experience of how we are training. And we have been training for the last 25 years, young people, so that they can go back to the farm. In general, in Europe, the evolution of the agro-agri-food system has been based on having local agri-food systems by a region or by district. And it has moved on to the globalization and industrialization of the farm. So now we are part of a global system of food distribution and raw material distribution where there's been a great loss of sovereignty the, of course, the farmers now depend a lot more on those global processes. They have no control over their own practices, and they can't control the practices either. And consumers feel that they can choose the type of food they uh, want to eat, but then they find that the, the, those food items are actually made with foodstuffs from different parts of the world. Because since we're part of the peasant uh, community and we wanted to see how we could approach this, looking for a more fair and sustainable farming system. And that's why we talked about food sovereignty. 
and we try to implement it in our region, trying to reconstruct a food system that is more local and that is more um, fair and sustainable. And in doing so, we saw that the main gap that we had was that we were lacking in farmers. We, of course, didn't have any more peasant community members willing to do farming. So we actually uh, proposed a strategy where we tried to uh, do training in agroecology at a time when most of the political and public organizations were actually uh, working on uh, monocrops or single crops and intensive farming. We were actually doing the opposite, natural farming because Luego agroecology wasn't known as a term back then. And then we began to talk about uh, ecological agriculture, because of course in Europe, they began to ban uh, artificial chemicals and, and methods. But uh, we now call the type of farming agroecology. It's not a science or a production uh, system. It's actually a transformation process, a collective one that looks at the farm and the context and also the people involved. 25 years ago, we began to uh, look at the cities. Of course, farms were uh, running out of uh, farmhands because people were moving to the cities. The, there was high diversity of crops and cattle farming, chickens, and also just uh, beef at the beef industry. But now we, of course, have uh, livestock and uh, farmers that are working with very intensive methods. And when we try to go, uh, move on to a more local model, we actually tried to draw people from the cities, uh, the, the ones who had left the farms. So we started a program that was a three-month program, twice a week, with more general criteria being offered, uh, different principles, and uh, just to talk about the fundamentals of the model and explaining what model we were looking for. And then we also talked about techniques and practices. So the first workshop was very successful. Many people signed up for it. And for the last 25 years, we have been offering those workshops, uh, depending on the demand, of course, and many people have gone through them. We have managed to uh, draw many people from the rural sector to those workshops, competing many times with the industry that offers much better working conditions. They pay more for people to work less. Uh, and so our training program was focused on on, the, on the peasants, on the farmers who wanted to uh, transform their systems. And also we were focused on people who had small plots of land and wanted to have uh, just uh, subsistence farming for their own use. So we tried to uh, work on that actually with those two groups of people. And also for people who wanted to actually uh, use those products, like the consumers. Because when we talk about food sovereignty or the reconstruction of food system, the consumers who have been to our workshops understand those criteria and shop according to them. So we have made a great effort to keep these programs uh, free, accessible to all the population. And one of the essential elements have been that we have deviated from that that have always been part of agroecology. You know, perma farming, biodynamics. All things to the same core that involves uh, Entonces, being final, more respectful eh, of the de land, of soil, and the people. Años, and so, in the last uh, decade, eh, we have made uh, changes in our workshops. And now we have had two uh, programs that have been aimed only at women and also have been delivered by women. So we have created very nice instances where some uh, women farmers and some non-farmers have been able to speak about their daily activities, their concerns, and the way they handle their farms. And now they have been requesting a second cycle of those uh, workshops. So we think that that new dimension has been quite interesting. We 
We've also had training processes for different organizations and stakeholders, bringing them together on weekends, and they have been quite successful too. The challenges that we face in the future, well, it's clear that in Europe we need more farmers and we need to access more um, assets. Owning land in Europe is very difficult. You're competing against industry, organizations, and large infrastructure projects. So it's very difficult to access soil, land, uh, seeds, and water. We need to have public policies that support such processes. For instance, in, in the Basque, uh, in the Basque country, forty percent of what is if 40% of what is uh, consumed were produced locally, we increase in people who would stay in their farms would be 500%. So with one single public policy, we could change our agri-food system. And something that we have been uh, doing and we've been able to disseminate is the whole agroecological model. We're creating critical but for us, what is key in Europe is to try to feed the whole population. Many times, the food distribution system at a global level offers ecological or healthy food stuff for an elite that can actually afford such products. So we want to move away from that and we want to promote access to most of the population to sustainable, healthy food items. So we want to have agroecological models that are accessible to all the population. Right now, that is very difficult because right now, uh, because we have this social energy and climate uh, crisis, of course, the privileged are the ones that can access those foods and the underprivileged populations are eating uh, unhealthy food. So we want to have more autonomous uh, farming with more inputs so that they can regulate their prices and they can actually uh, reach the whole population. Because if we do agroecology, buying all the raw materials, it can be done. But for us, agroecology is a process that seems to be um, growingly autonomous in fertilizers, fuel uh, costs, in many different uh, aspects. So to try to spend less on the inputs and to try not to have uh, patents and licenses to just move away from that. And to wrap up, I would like to say that 25 years after we started this program, we have found that uh, our purpose is clearer now. It involves, of course, a reconstruction of this whole agri-food system. We have laid the foundations for this, and we see that the population is understanding that food is a right and that we can't leave in the hands of farmers that responsibility. It's actually the whole of society's responsibility to fight for that land, to fight for that water and feed, and to generate the critical mass to help agriculture provide sustainable and healthy food for the whole population, not only in the European uh, continent, but the whole world. So I would like to thank you for listening, and I would also encourage those who are listening to participate and ask as many questions as they uh, wish. Thank you so much, Unai, for the experience that you have shared. It's been uh, very inspiring. And also, I uh, would like to thank you for uh, actually highlighting the role of women and youth in this transformative process. And of course, we know that the permanence and entry of young people in the agri-food system is key for sustainability and also for the livelihoods in rural areas. So that, of course, offers uh, a key uh, element for that to actually link agroecology and everything else has to do with the capacity building, which is a very uh, important approach. So thank you for the work that you're doing and for actually 
uh, inviting everyone to actually uh, join that effort. So we have several questions in the chat. And after this presentation that we will now see, uh, we will uh, again talk to our four panelists. We have one last presentation by Elente Brady, who will be talking about the advances in agroecology. Guilherme, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. I'm Brady, I'm the head of the Family, family Farming Participation and Parliamentary Networks Unit at FAO. This unit is in charge of giving technical support to implement uh, the UNDFF. And I would like to share with you a presentation. I'm going to start with the mention of the mention of the mention of the need of having public policies for transformation and changes and to scale sustainable practices. So I think that the core of my presentation is to discuss how we can foster regulatory frameworks, legal frameworks in, in different countries so as to promote agroecology. So I would like to share with you pillars, the importance of working with the parliamentary sector, not just the government, and the support that FAO offers in this field. You know how we work together with Parlatino, which is the Latin American Parliament that involves countries of Latin America, and also the origin of, of that demand to build a proposal about agroecology. I'm also going to be talking about the construction process of this proposal and a uh, link between uh, family farming of the UNDFF and agroecology, which I think is quite natural. So I'm talking also on behalf of a multidisciplinary team from FAU. We work from this unit together with the agroecology teams and the legal department of FAU and the regional office for Latin America to support this initiative along with our Latino. So I would like to start by saying why is it so important to work with the members of parliament in order to make progress on a proper uh, food system. There are four areas which are key for them. These are... Uh, they don't really get too much attention from the cooperation agency of the United Nations. In general, they, these areas are worked uh, by governments, but it's also important to work with the parliamentary members so that they can pass uh, the laws and the legal frameworks with all of these proposals that are developed together that need to be uh, approved by Congress. So, for instance, uh, to, to have budget, which normally is the task of the legislative role, so this uh, supports in political transition process that are always underway, so maintaining uh, this uh, topic in the agenda, uh, uh, it's uh, the high priority of a society, of a government. So it's also play an important role, the level of priority the Congress gives to these different topics. So the idea is not to redo things again about different topics, so we can have a better transition and maintain this topic in the agenda. 
cumplen un rol de supervisión they also have a supervision role and oversight uh, role the different si policies that are being executed whether the allocation of resources no, is actually happening and on top of the to, to represent and connect with different uh, types of uh, members of, of the country with citizens so this is why the FAO has been working for many years on, uh, with the parliaments in all, all over the world, and we've been supporting different topics. I mean, we promote the exchange of information, good practices by identifying the good practices, the good legislative practices. The, for instance, recently we've been analyzing and identifying the practices, the certification practices in terms of the information provided to the consumer about the nutritional characteristics of uh, food or seals that can provide uh, some direct and visual information to consumers in terms of uh, what they are eating. So on the one hand, we support this exchange. So we help different parliaments working together. And we also technically support the elaboration of bills to include elements to better structure some public policies and laws, which is, for instance, what we are doing with uh, the Framework Act about agroecology. Sometimes even training uh, parliamentary members so that they can better understand the different dimensions uh, and they can uh, include these components the, when the discussing the different uh, uh, bills uh, or uh, policies. Uh, and also by facilitating the creation of uh, links, relationships, and uh, partnerships between parliamentarians and parliamentary bodies. Now, there's something that's very particular which are different parliamentary fronts against Quizás hunger and poor nutrition, malnutrition. So maybe some of you have already heard about this. So there are different parliamentary uh, fronts which started working on this in Latin America, but it was then extended in different regions. So the idea is to uh, bring uh, parliamentaries from different political bodies to work together on different topics related to food uh, safety and nutrition so that countries can have better frameworks, regulatory frameworks about uh, different topics related to family farming. We uh, just completed a world a summit with about hunger and malnutrition in Chile uh, in June in the city of Valparaíso. So, so we are adding more dimensions to these discussions uh, so that uh, parliamentary members can uh, work on better frameworks, legal frameworks. So based on this effort, we also work with the uh, Latin American and Caribbean parliamentary uh, on also different national parliamentary fronts. Uh, every year wants to work with the parliament, regional parliamentary bodies. So we also have the Pan-African Parliament and there are some entities also in Asia that are being created and in the Middle East, for instance. So we are also trying to create a specific agenda with this space because the experience with Parliament has helped us to create a results. We are working on this uh, law to, remod to model uh, what we're doing in agroecology, but we have been working together with other framework legislation programs at Latin American level. It has direct implications on national parliaments. They act as a reference point, and we worked in the past with a model of family agriculture 
los países latinoamericanos para Latino. Different parliaments use that law as a reference point to then have their own legislation. So there is a broad and nutritional uncertainty about climate change, for instance, so sustainable food systems. And now we are developing this proposal to be considered by Palatino about the model uh, act in agroecology. So it would be cutting edge uh, regulation because it would contribute to the redesign of the food systems and it would help us coordinate different areas uh, under just one legislation. It would also be useful to support different countries about agroecology in the region. So I'm certain that this will also is going to be uh, attracted by different regions. So, so is, is, we've been working on this since 2020, so 2021 with Parlatino. This was a analyze and study in terms of how, why to create, why creating a regulations for agroecology and how this can have an impact on food systems. And based on that debate with Palatino, we were asked to create a, a bill. So that's the purpose, to create a, a bill about agroecology. And based on that request, we've been working on three phases during uh, that year. We had uh, three public consultations covering the regions of Central America, Caribbean, and Latin America. And we uh, systematized the results of that uh, survey. And now we are preparing a, a bill on agroecology, which is going to be reviewed by uh, the Platini in November. Everything is uh, moving forward as expected. Aquí les dejo algunas so I would like to give you some highlights in terms of the consultations, uh, the consultation, consultation process, of course, the regional the uh, approach, uh, the connection rural urbano, uh, between the urban and rural areas, the role of youngsters, the role of women, and the role of indigenous communities, for instance, are things that are the highlights. So, based on that consultation, we structured a, a framework of key aspects that uh, the law needs to cover. So, I mean, there is an area that is common for different uh, legislations, but some of them are quite specific. So it's interesting to see that there is an area about the registration system of agroecological products, monitoring and surveillance systems, some areas related to science, technology, and education, participation, culture, tradition, financial resources, for instance, some uh, emergency situations, and other aspects. And uh, to close, I would like to talk about that conne the connection between agroecology and this uh, bill. Uh, I think that almost 100% of farmers who practice agroecology Family farmers. So this is an expectation or it's a dimension, a vision of uh, sustainability transformation. Now, what it's important is how this agro how our ecology contributes to the different pillars of the global action plan of the uh, 10 year plan of the UNDFFs. So we have a plan for a 10-year period from 20, 
19 to 2028, so that we have seven pillars, and agroecology covers almost all of them. So we are working to create a political environment to strengthen family farming. That's pillar one. Pillar two is for young people. Pillar three is uh, gender equality, leadership of women. We know about the role of youngsters and women in agroecology. And based on the presentations of the previous speakers, we've noticed how um, the investment of uh, on, on training when it comes to agroecology, there are several experiences related to agro, agricultural schools and about the exchange between uh, farmers. So this is a process that that is part of the different organizations. So it connects with Pillar 4 of the 10-year uh, plan. So this is also a system that can focus on social and economic inclusion. <laughs> So, by working with what you have available in nature, and it connects with Pillar 6 and 7, which are those connected to the environment agenda of biodiversity, culture, and territorial development and social innovation. So to us, it's very important. So as we support the implementation of the UNDFF and supporting the countries so as to implement national plans related to family farming so that they can also see there's some uh, components to promote uh, agroecology as part of their national plans plans and use as a reference a law about agroecology that can inspire them and guide them to think whether the legal frameworks are appropriate to promote agroecology. So I'm sure this is going to be very helpful. So I would like to thank you and I'm here for any questions you may have. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, Guillermo, por, por tu excelente presentación. Justamente el tema thank de, you, Guillermo, de, for that excellent presentation. It's important to have guidelines and frameworks, and that's something that we actually addressed in the previous session of this dialogue uh, series. And this, of course, will help in that work, especially in the countries in our region and globally also. So thank you so much for sharing. Now we have 15 minutes for questions and also for any comments. There are many in the chat, so we have been uh, looking at them uh, with the team. So we will offer the floor first to those of you who have uh, your raised your hand. And then we will ask a question to four panel members. Please feel free to answer the questions according to what points you want to prioritize related to your work. And then if you want to offer any closing remarks uh, with regard to the presentation that we have had today, you can uh, do so. Please, anyone speaking, please uh, address the question to the person you want to answer the question and please introduce yourselves briefly. So we have Emilio first. Go ahead, Emilio. Emilio, you can uh, ask your question. Go ahead, please. Emilio, I think you're, you have to uh, turn on your microphone and mute your microphone, please. Good afternoon, everyone. We had a small technical problem, but uh, Valentina will be back with us in a few minutes. Uh, we were providing 
We were uh, going to hear what Emilio would like to say, but he was able to admit his phone. So, Malik, Malik, so, your hands have been raised. So, Malik, go ahead and ask your question, please. Bonjour à toutes et à tous, et merci beaucoup à la FAO. Qui, uh, nous a donné pour, uh, thank cas, you. I would like to thank FAO for the opportunity ben, moi, to so, actually be able to be part of this. My name is Malik So. Uh, I am from Senegal and I am a member of the Castle Watt uh, team. And I am also part of the team that validates scientific knowledge as part of that same project. There are many topics that I actually found very interesting. And I think that peasants are usually exploring their territory. They're always trying to look for options. I actually did some research. And uh, everything that I've heard here of peasants and what they do, and you know, they, they have a lot of wisdom to share. So they uh, can be part of uh, actually um, tackling their own problems. In Senegal, for instance, the peasants uh, actually use many terms without a scientific perhaps explanation, but they might say, well, you can't transplant, a woman cannot transplant peppers or tomatoes if they are with their menstrual period, if they're menstruating. Because and sometimes they say that the pepper plant doesn't like people to look at it. So sometimes they talk about these concepts without a scientific background. And from that point of view, we can see that everything that farmers say makes a lot of sense, but it is usually ignored by science. And I think it would be actually advisable for us to be able to hear what the farmers want, need, have to say and to look at what they're doing because of what they say and what they're doing, there's a scientific uh, background to that. For instance, when farmers say that people Pepper plants don't like people to look at them. What does that mean? Well, now they, we have realized that in an agricultural field, the, 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 the plant, when it's, it's discovered, it becomes dehydrated and the leaves fall off. So what the pest center farmers think is that by looking at it, we have done that. And sometimes they see that everything is okay, and that's because no one is looking at the plant. So the explanation of the farmer is that the eyes of the person are the ones that uh, cause the plant to lose its leaves. But actually, it's the pressure of the, the wind that does that. So these are all inherent um, items that farmers share. There's always uh, an explanation for what they actually uh, observe. So uh, with this, I leave you, and uh, I was very happy to be part of this uh, um meeting and I would like to continue sharing with you. Thank you so much for your intervention. Now we will continue with other comments because it's uh, such a, an interesting discussion. So we'll offer the floor to two more people and then we will uh, hear what the panel members uh, want to say. Where, if anyone has any problems, uh, uh, time constraints, just let us know. Now I would like to offer the floor to Adrian. Adrian, uh, the floor is yours. Please ask your question. Hola, buenos días, ¿qué tal? Eh, mi nombre es Adrián Hello, Yubay. good morning, my name is Adrián Yubay. Me gustaría preguntarles cómo es que se puede I hacer am from Mexico la reducción like de los microplásticos, sobre todo en la agricultura microplastics, especially in uh, family Muchísimas farming. Gracias, How can you reduce it? microplastics? So, thank you for your question. And we have taken note of it for the panel members to answer it later. 
And so now we will offer the floor to somebody else. Curly. Okay, yes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Curly Ajon. I am a student of agroecology. I come from Ecuador. And my question is focused on um, agroecology because I'm a student of that. And I want to know how the organizations like FAO encourage uh, agroecology students to actually make academic knowledge and what we know of family farming because some people, of course, are interested in agroecology because of ambition, y others because it's a fad, and uh, there are other people that just, like myself, come from farmers, and we know the farms este, and the communities. La FAO puede so the question is how FAO can intervene in that so that we can leave aside fads and ambition and can focus on the importance Perdón, seguridad alimentaria of uh, food security todo, este, soberanía alimentaria. and food sovereignty. Thank you, Curly, for your question. And we are very happy to hear that young people such as yourself are taking part in a meeting such as this one. So thank you so much, Curly. Now the panel members. There are several questions in the chat. To sum up, and I apologize if I am leaving anything out, for the four panel members, can you please start answering the questions and talking about the comments of the people who have just um, spoken and to talk about the cost for small farmers when it comes to adopting agroecological practices and what are the impacts of that transition of agroecology in rural areas and what is the role of governments and civil society? when it comes to driving that transition. So this is for the four panel members. You can pick and choose the most important aspects of those uh, questions and to um, tell us what you think about them. Swati no está disponible en Ah, adelante. Go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, very in interesting uh, question on the role of governments, the role of civil society. So, in the context of India, and I'm sure you can also look at it from the context of your regions. What we have realized is scaling is job of the government. Scaling and saturation, talking about, you know, we are restricting majorly what we have seen across the world. The dialogues at the political level stops, at, especially for agroecology, stops at policy. We need to look beyond, we need to talk beyond policy and talk about how government can become implementing or promote agroecology rather than just talking about, you know, we restrict, if we assume that policy is the last bid of, of, of transformation or the change. But the idea is that implementation of those policies, implementation of programs, looking at it from... So the scaling aspect is government's job. Civil societies and NGOs, they should focus on developing the knowledge and the champion farmers and the models and micro models that are required to scale up. So they should be, especially NGOs and civil society, they should not focus on scaling. Scaling is not job. What we realize in India, our experience is civil society should not bother about more farmers. They should work, say, with 100 farmers, but demonstrate that, you know, with 100 farmers, this is doable. Let's do it with 1,000. Now, for doing the 1,000, it's the job of the government, of the local bodies, of of of, of community, uh, larger communities, not job, is, is what we realize the job of civil societies should be. They should focus on those. So I would like to address these two elements. I believe uh, governments, and that is the reason we want more go governments, policymakers, politicians of, of whatever category, democratics, republic, I don't know. I mean, in India context, we have the right wing, the left wing, whatever. We need to bring them on board because we everybody eats food in spite of their orientation. So I think it's very crucial, that discussion. So I, I leave to other panel members to address other Thank you very much, Swati. Muchísimas gracias, Swati. Vamos a...
Thank you so much. Now we will move on to the next panel member. Si quieres abordar alguna de estas preguntas, comentarios del Arthur, if you want to actually talk about any of the comments and questions. Bon, pas trop, mais je pense que y a un participant qui a demandé. I don't know. Moi, je pense que au niveau du Togo, nous avons eu vraiment c'est la FAO qui We've talked about the role of FAO. Well, in Togo, I think FAO was the one that triggered the process. Perhaps not much has been done with the state, but in the case of Togo, we are lucky to have a program that FAO can have direct influence in working with civil society and peasants. And thanks to that program, we have been able to put together actions for training in agroecology, and we were able to harness all that so that this practice can be considered by the state. I think that if in other countries, specific programs such as the one we have could be deployed, it would really be helpful. I think that we have actually tried to engage the state because sometimes the state is more interested in chemical products. Because that, of course, uh, there's a lot of vested interest in that. And civil society can and should make requests so that the state can be involved in agroecology. So thank you so much. I would like to thank you for having included me in this panel. It was a great pleasure for me, and I was able to see and understand what is going on in other areas. And also to learn about the dynamics when it comes to the parliament. At the African level, we don't have that yet. But I think that we will exchange information regionally on that to see how this parliament uh, type of program can be used to help agro agricultural uh, practices and policies. Thank you, Arthur, for your uh, comments. Now I'd like to give the floor to Unai. You have a few minutes. Thank you. I'm going to try and answer some of the questions by making a, maybe some final uh, remarks. Um, I mean, how we can uh, stop depending on microplastic in a society that is completely dependent on oil. And I think that this is a general reflection we need to make as a society. And of course, we need to move towards more sustainable models. And as part of these more sustainable models, we can have different partnerships, particularly with NGOs. I think uh, that the role of NGOs is important, provided that they don't appropriate the voice of a farmer. And sometimes the priorities and needs are different, but they are certainly important. They play an important role. We also have the academia. And many contents and many knowledge is, comes from the country, and the academia allows us to systematize this knowledge. But this is, should be a joint effort. Sometimes the academia doesn't want to understand the uh, sentimental part related to the knowledge coming from uh, the rural area. Sometimes, uh, uh, we feel bad because it doesn't rain, for instance. And then I would like to think about the public policies. Sometimes we forget that we have public policies locally. Different municipalities have tools to implement some processes, particularly if these are uh, strategic, uh, not in the, in the short term, so that they can also uh, be have some political support. And something that's very common in Europe, it's the cultural shock between the cities uh, and the rural areas. The rural areas designed to feed cities and to provide energy to cities. 
So sometimes we have cultural shock because in the rural area we feel, we feel threatened uh, by wind farms, by solar panels, and a lot of infrastructure that are used to feed cities. So we need to have an alliance, a cultural alliance, rather than a cultural shock. Thank you, Unai, for your for your comments. Now, to finish, I would like to give the floor to Guilherme, who would like to cover some of the questions or maybe give some closing remarks. Thank you, Valentina. I think that there is a specific question about the process of the analysis and approval of a regulatory frameworks. Uh, FAO presents a bill to Palatino and we are including uh, this topic to be discussed early in 2024. So the analysis process or the discussion process of Par Latino should start in the first semester of 2024. Then we need, we don't control those processes, those internal processes. So we don't know exactly when this discussion process would be completed. But in terms of the expected results, uh, I think that, if, for instance, based on other experiences of Par Latino uh, in relation to other framework rules, for instance, there is a framework of, of, from Par Latino about family farming, so the structure, the criteria, etc. And you can see that that regulation was the inspiration for many other countries countries so that they could create their own national legislation. So we hope that this can foster the creation of more and better laws about agroecology in the countries of this region. Now, that, of course, in its, it's not enough on its own. And, uh, of course, the governments, the national states, play a significant role in this regard. If the existing policies can be adapted to promote agroecology, then we need to think about the specific policies required to promote agroecology. And uh, because the, we need to think about how we can better coordinate actions from different sectors of the government to foster this, because a sector may uh, foster one sustainable practice, but then have another area of the government moving a different way. So there needs to be coordination between different ministries to promote agroecology. I think there was another question related to that about uh, recognition and certification. I think that most of the questions related to costs uh, imply certifying private certification in order to have access to some niches, uh, to some markets. So maybe we could think about public certifications in broader certification systems of some criteria that may validate uh, publicly this to reduce their certification costs in general, the, the private certification costs. So I think uh, that in some countries of the region, they already have some elements that can be part of a broader policy. There are registrations, for instance. So they could use that uh, related to social environmental compliance. So I think that there are options that need to be explored along with other options that are not just a private certification in order to promote scale uh, agroecology so that it's not just a niche market. Thank you, Valentina.
Bueno, con Thank esta, you, Guillermo. Este comentario final de nuestros cuatro panelistas. So, after these uh, final video, comments, we are going eh, to close this session, and I would like to thank all the participants and all, all of those who join us in the three sessions that we had about this topic. I would also like to thank the Brazil leadership on family farming for their support on the organization of these three sessions. And of course, I would like to thank again our excellent speakers and panel members today and in the other sessions. So thank you very much. Uh, the recording is going to be available for all of you. We've already heard the link to the recording in the chat. And we're going to be sharing with you more information about different initiatives in which we are working in FAO. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a great rest of the day.